If you want to see God move, just start moving. You know, Wigglesworth said, if the Spirit of God don't move me, I move the Spirit. That's what he said, and he just would do stuff. He would do the stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, he was an amazing apostle of faith. Praise the Lord. I'm real excited to uh, take you here to Revelation chapter 2 if you want to turn to your Bibles. And um, we're going to take a look at that. It was an honor for Darren to ask me to, to do that. I actually uh, was hoping I'd get to do Revelation chapter 2. I told the Lord that. And um, sure enough, I got to do it. Funny how that works, huh? Yeah, God is amazing that way. Well, uh, Revelation chapter 2, let's start with, uh, well, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. We learned that from Darren. I'm not going to go through the whole, you know, spiel on that, except to say that the Apocalypse, Revelation, and in, in, in the U.S., we say Apocalypse, but it's actually Apocalypse, uh, means the first part of the word apo means a way. The word kalupas describes a veil or a curtain. When you put the two together, it's a curtain being moved away. So a veil is removed so you can see something. You ever get up in the morning, you have the curtain closed for the night, and you open them up, oh, look at it, it's sunny. Or if you live in Seattle, it's raining. But, <laughs> but you know, it is a, a new sight, a new uh, thing to look at, and that's kind of exciting. So um, it's basically, to, for it's a, revelation means an unveiling, to see into another realm. And we're talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ. I love, the Lord uh, wanted me to share 1 Peter 1.13 for you. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace. You know, God's grace is wonderful. It's his divine enablement. It's not just favor. It goes beyond that. He empowers you. He empowers you to serve him, to live for God. You can't live for God without grace. You can't get saved without grace. You're saved by grace through faith. That, not of yourselves. Wow. You just get to say yes <laughs> and invite Jesus into your life. Well, it says here that rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, at the revealing of Jesus Christ. So I want you to know that as we go through the book of Revelation, there's a promise to you of unveiling. There's a promise to you of God imparting grace to you that you might see Christ in a whole new way or a more like bigger way. I mean, he, has, he is so big. He's God, right? I'll never forget the first time I realized that Jesus was Jehovah. The what? You know, I knew he was the son of God. I gave my life to him. But then later on, it dawned on me just by revelation of the word, he's God. You know, he's God, very God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're all one. Each one, God, very God. And so um, he's not just the son of God, son of man. He is God. And so uh, you never want to forget that. And so, um, you know, we want to worship him as king. And we were singing that song, All Hail King Jesus. And I, I, I told my wife that reminded me of a testimony. I shared it earlier, but I'm going to share it again. Is that uh, I pulled up to church and there was a couple of youth, about three of them, they pulled up to church. They got out and uh, they got out and they turned to look at the church, put out their hands and they said, All Hail Satan. I know, yuck, huh? Yucky, say yuck. Yeah. Thank you. And so... Um, <clears throat> I said, no, all hell, King Jesus, all hell, King Jesus. And so they just, oh, and they started to take off. <laughs> yeah, I was speaking with authority. And so um, I said, wait a minute, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Hang on. Hang on. And so they stopped and I came up and just started to talk with them. What are you guys up to? You know, just teenagers, right? You know, they got all the garb and the, everything. And, and so um, anyway, I started talking to them about the Lord, how good he was and how there was power in the name of Jesus. How would you like to experience the power of God? And so uh, one guy said, yeah, sure. And so I said, well, put your hands out. And I put my hand just about that far. You know, I didn't touch him. Just, and and uh, he put his hand, I put my hand underneath, excuse me. And um, so I just, Holy Spirit come, and all of a sudden, he just his eyes get big. <laughs> I could feel the power of God. I mean, sometimes you can feel the power of God, really. And uh, 
So anyway, uh, he just started to like kind of shake and, what's that? What's that? I said, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the power of God. And uh, wow. I said, yeah. So <laughs> I just started talking to him and they were on an assignment. They had to get somewhere. And he says, well, that's awesome. Uh, we got to go. And so they left. Well, I went into the church and a few minutes later, not too long, they, they came back. I said, hey, we were at a party last night, you know, just with some friends. And this guy walked in and... Um, he said he was a Satanist, and, I was, and he said he pointed his finger across the room at a pop bottle, and it blew up. And I said, yeah, I said, the devil's got, the cult has some power. And it's not Jesus, it's all power, you know. <laughs> and, they, and they said, but yeah, but, um, you know, ever since last night, we haven't been able to get the thoughts of suicide out of our head, heads. And that's because the devil, what's his M.O.? I come to kill, steal, and destroy, right? But Jesus came that you might have a life, right? And have it more abundantly. So if you're a witch and you're here today, you need to repent because your boss wants to kill you. But Jesus wants to give you life. He really loves you. So I wouldn't hesitate. I wouldn't wait because he's, he's out to do you no good. He's just using you. God doesn't use people. God loves people. So anyway, they came back in, and, and they said, and I said, well, let me pray for you. So I prayed for him, you know, and blessed him. And, and <laughs> then they went outside, and they did something. I don't, you shouldn't do this, but they went outside, and then they came back in all excited again. And, and I said, what's up? And um, they said, well, we went outside. We tried for at least, I don't know, three minutes to think about thoughts of death and suicide, but nothing would stick. Nothing would come near us. We, we couldn't even do that. <laughs> teenagers, right? <laughs> so I said, well, all right, praise the Lord. Don't do that. But listen, you need to, you need to know Jesus. So I ended up leading him to Christ. You know, and they got born again. And so it's, it's uh, all hell King Jesus. Uh, you know, the words that you speak, their spirit and their life. And so don't ever be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God into salvation. Matter of fact, in today's world where we live, the gospel is your best offense, defense, offense, defense, yeah, no, defense. It's your best tool for, to survive, to live, you know. You might have a Glock, that's fine. You might have a shotgun. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the gospel is your best defense. I, trust me, I've, I've seen that, I've known that, experienced that. Um, I was sharing Christ with a guy who pulled a gun out of his glove box and pointed at me and said, well, this is my piece, dude. And I said, well... You're not going to have peace at all until you give your life to the Prince of Peace. Yep. And uh, so he said, well, um, where do you go to church? <laughs> When's the church at a service? I told him, you know, and he was in the neighborhood. Anyway, uh, no, I'll never be ashamed. It's your best defense, okay? I actually had like six guys jump me and... Um, Worked me over and kick and hit and beat me. I didn't feel a thing. Didn't feel a thing. There was no bruise, no cuts. I got up. They tried to grab me. They couldn't hang on to me. I just walked, walked out. That's the power of God. That's the power of God. And so um, don't be afraid in this world. You know, the fear of man brings a snare. But they that trust in God shall be delivered and free. From all evil. So, you know, I don't go looking for trouble, but I'm not going to run away, you know, you know, from an opportunity to share Jesus if it comes up. And so um, it's an adventure, huh, Mary? <laughs> I said, so anyway, she says, get to the word. Well, um, <laughs> rabbit trail, sorry. But, you know, the class on evangelism does that to me. That's really something that's in my heart, okay? So, Ephesus, chapter 2, an amazing church, very powerful, very important strategic trip because of its location. You could, from Ephesus, you could go out into Asia and plant churches. Matter of fact, they did that. They had a, there was a road called the Postal Road, and all those churches listed here, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, they're on that same road. And, and, and the road actually went out and made a turn and came back around this way. And so it was very strategic to plant there. And that's just like God. 
You know, God puts you in a strategic place, even where you live, where you work, the church you go to. That's all in God's design. He has a design. He has a, a, a strategy for the kingdom, for you. And so don't take that lightly. You're there where you live for a purpose. Now, you may move again, right? It may not be your permanent place, but God's opened the door. You're there. So, okay, God, what do you want to do in my neighborhood, right? Yes. So the church had relevance today. Um, this church has relevance for us today, I believe. This is the first of seven churches. Most of them had defects and even some carnality. Yet Jesus Christ said in Revelation chapter 1, they were golden. Call them golden lampstands. You know, the, the actual um, lamps in those days weren't made out of gold. They're made out of clay. Okay? And they had a reservoir of oil. oil. Then they have a, a rope or piece of cloth that came in the mouth. And you light it and, because it would soak up oil. And then it had a handle on the other end where you could kind of go like this and steer it wherever you wanted to see, you know, and you are lights of the world, and Jesus wants to take you and steer you to where he wants to bring his love, okay? And uh, so you want to keep your oil filled. The good news is if you leak, <laughs> if you run out, you can get more, and uh, Christ is the source. So praise the Lord for that. So anyway, uh, but he saw golden for the church, those seven golden candlesticks. And it says that Jesus walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. If you can imagine, tall, I thought I had, a, I was going to try to get a picture. Tall golden candlesticks, like all around you like this, seven of them. He was right there in the midst. That's, picture, that's a picture of Christ in the midst of his church. See, he walked through those churches in Revelation. I'll tell you what, he's walking through every church today. He visits this church. He does. He shows up. He shows up at the church down the street. Any church that's a living church, you know, that, and uh, some churches you may not even figure he would. He does. It's it, really. And um, it's amazing. But he, he cares for his church. He loves his church. But he says in chapter 2, verse 2, he goes on, says, I know thy works. Now Christ begins to get very specific with the church of Ephesus. The word know is the Greek word idio. It means to behold, to perceive. It can describe a scrutinizing look or look with an intent to examine, to fully view or to experience, to know from personal observation. You see, he didn't get a letter. He didn't get a message from an angel. He showed up. I'm checking out this church. This is my church, right? I gave my life for the church. So he is very interested in the church, and he's very interested in each one of us. Amen. So he's looking, to, he's looking, he's going to give a report, basically. He says, uh, in two, when I know your works, in the Greek, actually, it says it differently. I know the works of you. I know the works of you, each one of you, my works. He knows the works of each church. He knows the works of each person within the church. The word works describes the deeds or activities, labors, things that we produce in our life, right? How many of us, we, we work, most of us probably work, got a job, go to work, come home, right? Relax, whatever, go to school. But there are, there are other works. There's works and acts of service. You might be um, on staff of a church. You might be a part of a church where you're a volunteer, right? And so there's lots of activity going on in churches all around the country, really. And so he begins to describe the activities, everything there is to know about you and all you do. And uh, if that was true of Jesus then, it's still true of Jesus today because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, what Jesus did is still true of what Jesus does. Nothing escapes the intention of Christ who is the head of the church. He still walks amongst us. So he begins to reveal to the church of Ephesus and calls them to make some changes. He calls them to repent and make a few things right. All right. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much that you know everything about us. There's nothing you do not know 
And we ask you to address those issues, God, in our life that you want to change. Thank you, Lord, that you still think we're golden in spite of us. Father, thank you for your word in Ecclesiastes 8.4 that says, where the word of the king is, there's power. Let the word of the king release power into our life today. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, verse 2, he says, I know your works, your labors. And in the Greek, it's, I know the labors of you, which is especially speaks of you. All right? You've worked hard. You've toiled. And some of you are weary because it, it can be hard work. It can be hard work physically, mentally, spiritually. Right? Okay? That's what he's describing. Work, someone who, does, who has a job or an assignment applied to either physical, mental, or spiritual effort. He knows that they're a hardworking church, and he's not, uh, that's not a condemnation. That's a commitment, really, because he said, hey, you're hardworking. You're not lazy. God doesn't bless laziness. The Bible says the hand of the diligent makes you rich, Right? You're not going to get rich sitting on a couch or going to play lotto or whatever. That's just the luck of the draw. But if you, work is <laughs> work, <laughs> it takes work, effort. Amen? Okay, so it's the biggest church in the region, and they're training up ministry leaders or sending people out. It's a missionary based church for the whole of Asia, and it was a hard working church. And he continues, I know your patience. That means to remain in one spot. The church in Ephesus had a unique and very important place, and they refused to surrender it. They'd come into Ephesus where the temple of Artemis was, where you're, you're talking 6,000 priests and priestesses of Baal. Okay? Offerings, you know, it's giving up sacrifice to a demon god. And that's where the church is planted. There might have been just a little bit of spiritual warfare. I'm not sure, but I'm guessing. And, and, um, and so they had to deal with some stuff. And so they were, but you know, they endured. They, they were patient. They hung in there. Okay, no matter how much they were persecuted, they endured. They weren't going to give in to any pressure. They weren't going to give up. Nope. They had staying power. They said, we're not quitters. It pictures stamina and durability. And Jesus says, Wow. All this is commendable, but wait, he's not done. He goes on to say, and you cannot bear those who are evil. The word evil is the word kakos, kakos. The word describes that which is evil, because look where they're living. Okay, evil, vile, foul, or destructive, unacceptable thoughts or actions, actions that are harmful, hurtful, or injurious, an action done with an evil intent, that results in damages or ruins one's life or the life of another. It is evil. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. This would be really good for you to know. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 13. And who is he who will harm you? The word harm is the same word, kakos. If you become followers of what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. You are blessed. Now that word, again, harm is kakos. What is the Holy Spirit saying? He's saying, listen, when these people come to harm you, they're coming with demonic intentions. They may not realize it, but they're simply instruments of the enemy. Okay? There's something demonic about the persecution, of course, right? Why does persecution come? To try to get you to cower down, to stop, to forfeit your testimony, to, to become passive. And then he says, but if, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, and you know what? Sometimes you do suffer for righteousness' sake. He says, um, you're blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Don't, that word afraid and troubled, don't be afraid of their threats, excuse me, is a word, Greek word phobos. Phobos. What do you hear when I say phobos? Phobia. What is he saying? He's saying don't have a phobia about their phobia. 
because they're afraid of you. You know, what you, what you don't understand, you know, you want to control. You want to do something about it because it can affect your life, right? And so these, if they're walking in fear, don't fear their fear. You walk in love because perfect love casts out all fear because fear has torment. So we're called to walk in love, amen? Okay, that's, that's good. So, uh, you know, we're living in times where we may see some more persecution in this country. I don't know. It's certainly happening in the world, right? Places out there are pretty dark. It's happening. And so here's a letter from John, which mu must have really lit them up because John was like in his 90s when he wrote this, 93, I believe. And um, they really thought he was probably gone. Like, they didn't know he was still alive. He's in a cave. Yet Christ appears to him, the king of, of glory, gives him a letter for the churches, and he says in the beginning, I, John. And then he says it again, I, John. And this is John. It's me. Hey, <laughs> I'm still alive. The apostle Paul had died 20 years earlier. Timothy, he died when he was 80. And actually it was Timothy that took over this church. Paul planted it. He was there for two years. He took off, went further, plant churches, and he installed Timothy as an overseer. And that's where Timothy was. And so, you know, when John shows up, the, the, the one who laid on Jesus' breath, remember? Right there on the side of his breast. Yeah. I, it may have something to do with how long he lived. I don't know. You know, when you're walking in love like that, look, at there's an example right there. She's got her head on, on him, you know. And so that's what John did. Cause, and John, and you know what? The, the disciple that Jesus loved is what he said about himself. Did you know that I'm the disciple that Jesus loved? I am. So are you. So are you, absolutely. I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. So look at this church knew their responsibility. They were gatekeepers to Asia, all right? And then he says um, that uh, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and found them liars. In other words, when somebody walked through the doors of that church and said, I'm an apostle, they didn't just say, oh, hallelujah, here comes another apostle. You know, whatever, you know. You know the purpose of an apostle is not to say, ooh, there goes one. <laughs> It simply means sent one, okay? And so God could raise you up and send you somewhere. That would be an apostolic work or an apostolic assignment, okay? And so um, anyway, he says, you've tested or tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and you found them out to be liars. The word tried in the Greek means an intense examination that proves the fitness of an object or a person, it is a fiery process that removes impurities from metal in the ancient world. It also used to try coins to determine if they're authentic or counterfeit. And there, are, there were counterfeit apostles back then. There probably might be some today too. You, you know. And um, don't wave if you know one. And so, but they're out there. You know, I actually had a, an apostle say to me, Hey, Greg, why are you going to Ireland? They don't give good offerings there. That's a weird thing to say. That's a revelation of a man's heart, right? It truly is. And the funny thing was, I, I went to Ireland because God said go to Ireland, right? And I preached that evening, not very long, I don't know, 30 minutes. That morning they took an offering for me. <laughs> and then they do something I wish they wouldn't do. They announce it. We'd like to say that we have given Pastor Greg $3,000. And so they handed me $3,000. That's not bad for 30 minutes talking. And so I, I go back to my room, this is the truth, and I get on my knees and I am dumbfounded. I am just like shocked. I mean, I'm, I'm humbled is what I am. And I said, God, you set me up. And he laughs. I heard him laugh. And he says, oh, so they don't give good offerings here, do they? <laughs> and uh, that's a true story. And so, uh, you, you know, 
There are real apostles, but then there are some apostles that, well, you just got to be careful, right? And they, they tested them, okay, because uh, they were, the Greek says they assert they're apostles and are not, and you found them liars. Actually, the word liars means bogus. Bogus liars. Pretend apostles. Wow. You know, like that liar, liar, pants on fire. You know, one of these days, I want to see some pants on fire. I want to see somebody running out with their pants on fire. Not really, but I just, we say that all the time. I've never seen somebody with their pants on fire. Okay, so they understood that they were gatekeepers, and they understood that they're being inundated with all kinds of new revelation, false apostles, false sent ones, who knew, hey, if I can make it in Ephesus, that's going to blow up my Facebook page. I mean, if I can make it here, it's going to be my website, my Instagram account, everything's just going to skyrocket, and I can really get a lot of fame, I can make a lot of money, and so let's do this. But the church of Ephesus was wise, they're very discerning, and they wouldn't just give a rubber stamp on anybody, and neither should we, right? We need to have discernment, okay? And um, because not everybody loves Jesus that walks in this place. And I'm happy to say that you have elders here whose, whose job is to serve you, but they also watch out for you. Okay? They do. They do. And um, there's times when we've had to address that, an individual, but it's, no, it's not done publicly to shame anybody. It's done privately. And uh, that's just good stewardship. That's good government. So he said, you know, they've, uh, you found them to be false. And I was thinking about that, and I looked at Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, where John says, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you see the humility on how he identified with them? Right? He didn't say, I, John, the last great apostle. I, John, your brother, fellow soldier, suffering, you know. That's John's heart. I love that about John. Yeah. Let's drop down to verse 6. We'll come back to verse 4. Because I want to talk about for a little bit the Nicolaitans. Okay. But this you have, again, he's commending them. Okay, they've done the test. They're hard workers, they're patient. And this they have, they hate. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Look at hate is a strong word. In our family, when the kids were growing up, you never said, I hate. You know, I hate you. That didn't, sorry. You know, (laughs) especially if you said, I hate mom. No, 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 that won't fly. You know, and they didn't. But I'm just saying, you got to be careful with that word hate. Well, these, this group called the Nicolaitans were in Ephesus and are also in Pergamos. They're a group of teachers who said, now, wait a minute. We don't need to be so strict or separated. The pagans are good people. We could just join them in a sacrifice to their demon god and then, you know, go out to lunch, then maybe lead them to Christ. <laughs> I show, Come here, Brad. Let's do this demonstration. So, like... If Brad wanted to pull me down, yeah, he could, really easy, right? Because I'm up here. If I wanted to pull him up to where I want him to be, that's, that's not going to happen. He, see? So, like, if you think that you can come alongside and befriend someone who's not a Christian, you better have some wisdom, especially if they're involved in things they shouldn't be involved in. I'm not, say, I'm not saying don't be a friend of sinners. I'm just saying... Use wisdom. You know, I mean, have an agenda. What's the agenda? To see them get born again and saved. To see them experience God's love. I've seen too many times where somebody says, well, I, I know she's like that, you know, or he's like that, but, you know, I just want to, I just want to, you know, hang out with them, you know, and maybe I'll get to lead them to Christ. And then it, this the whole thing takes place where they're pulled down instead of pulling the person up. 
So, you know, Jesus was a friend of sinners and so are we. Okay? And it says he hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He didn't say he hated them, right? He didn't say, I hate the Nicolaitans. He did not. Why would he hate someone he paid the price for, died for? But he hated their deeds because they, their problem was with them, they were condoning compromise. And Jesus was against it. Well, there was young people coming into the church of Ephesus, right? And they're getting saved and they need to grow in the wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. But if the Nicolaitans are, are bringing compromise, you're subjugating the people. And matter of fact, the word Nicolaitans means conquering the laity. So they're going to conquer these people. Okay, So Christ was very, he did not like it. He said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And if Christ hates those deeds, so should we. Anything he hates, we should hate. He hates sin. Why? Because it destroys life. It destroys your life. He doesn't hate you. If you sin, you just confess it. And he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Right? But he hates the sin that hurts you, that separates you from him because he loves each one of us so much. He's a really good God. But sin kills if it's left just to continue. But Jesus says, no, no, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. All right. So, you know, with the Nicolaitans, they really didn't think it was important to be separate, you know, from the world. You know, let's just get along with them. Let's just compromise. Let's just show, you know, and, and hey, listen, if it means I, I can have peace with my neighbors, you know, and, and peace with the media, let's just say that. Let's just say same-sex marriage is okay. Let's just do that. That's compromise. And that is a form of a deed of a Nicolaitan to conquer, okay? You cannot do that. We cannot do that. We're to love people, right? But we have to stand for righteousness and holiness. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know what my life was like before I came to Christ. I was not a good person. Okay, I was a bad boy. And, and so I'm glad that he forgave me. I'm glad he changed me. I'm much nicer now than I was then. You would not have liked me back then. Okay, but I'm still in process, right? All of us are. Well, it's the same with the sinner out there who doesn't know God. We want to see them come into the kingdom and follow Jesus so God can just cause them to be all that he wants them to be. Better people. Amen? All right. So these um, spiritual leaders, these Nicolaitans of the past, they basically just sought to make a truce with the world under the guise of inclusiveness and compromise or elitism. A lot of that going on, actually. You know, it, it is sad the uh, events, current events that take place, have taken place in the church regarding, you know, a falling or sexual issues. And so we want to, we, you know, we want to help people like that, okay, as long as they repent. If they're willing to change, there's grace. There's grace. Remember the woman caught in adultery, right? They brought her to Jesus. He said, where are your accusers? He says, uh, I don't know, because they left after he wrote down in the, in the sand. One by one they left. And then he said, well, um, neither do I accuse, accuse you or condemn you. That was mercy. Neither do I condemn you. And then grace was, go and sin no more. That was grace. Okay. So she got mercy and grace. And Jesus came to reveal mercy and grace. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So they would just dress that all up in a, in a guise of inclusiveness. Okay? And um, regardless of their lifestyle, we just need to embrace them. You know, have them... Well, you need to embrace them in the sense that you need to pray for them. You need to love them. If they need clothing, clothe them. If they're hungry, feed them. Right? Don't ignore. But let's have it. Let's, let's do this. Let's do it wisely. Right? Yeah. Take heed to your own salvation, Scripture says. Okay? 
Take heed. Because what happens when you embrace that kind of thing, it basically just produces a powerless church. Powerless. To heal the sick, cast out demons. Powerless. And so that's not what the Lord wants of us. So then if you go back to verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Hmm. Done a lot of good things, he says, but you've left your first love. Now notice he didn't say you've abandoned me. They didn't say that. They didn't abandon Christ. They involuntarily left their first love because they got so caught up in the busyness of the day in the ministry and in the potlucks and the conferences and the choir practice and the, in the parking lot and whatever goes on in the church, a lot of stuff. They got caught up in that too much in the sense that they, their fervency for Jesus kind of died. It's still doing good stuff, okay? Literally in the Greek it says, your love, your first one you have left. Not only did they leave their first love, but they left the love that the Father had for them. See, it wasn't just their first love. It was the Father's first love. They had left the love of God, for God so loved the world that he gave, and, and uh, their fervency, their passion. There was a song years ago. I don't know if you remember this. I, it's called, I Miss My Time With You. I miss my time with you. Those moments we had together. It was sung by the person of Jesus and um, in the first, that personage, you know. And so uh, he wants to spend time with you. He loves it when you spend time with him. He really does. Do you remember when your heart burned with passion and zeal for God? Has it kind of grown cold? Has it maybe taken the back seat to all the pressures of life? There's pressure. The Bible says through much tribulation, which is pressure, you will enter the kingdom of God. So there's pressure that comes, but you have to have an inward force pushing out, driving out, that's bigger than that pressure. Otherwise, it'll squash you. And if you don't have the proper tools, you know, I could say, or, you know, relationship with the Lord, you could get hurt. Yeah. Remember what it's like? When you first got saved, you came to church and you, wow, you, I could, you couldn't wait to get to church to raise your hands to sing. And the Bible, oh my goodness, you started reading the Bible and it just like came alive. You just started, wow, this is water to my soul. I love God's word. Then, you know, I don't know. Sometime later, just with busyness, you go to work, you come home, you have dinner, you relax, you turn on the TV. Watch something, maybe a movie, maybe your favorite show, Hawkeye. And next thing you know, it's 10 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. And then you go to bed. Because you got to get to bed, you got to get up, go to work or school or whatever. And the next day, it's a kind of like the same thing happens. Before too long, you have left your first love. That fervency, passion is just not there. Right? Now, he's not condemning them, he's trying to help them. He's saying, look, you haven't abandoned me. You know, I see your hard work. I see your faithfulness. But this passion, this intimacy that we had is, is gone. And we need to fix that. We need to change that. How do you change that? He said, repent. Repentance is a really good word. <laughs> it really is. Okay? It just means change the way you're thinking. Change your direction. Stop and change. It doesn't mean you sit and you bawl and you squall and you cry. It, it doesn't, really, it's a word that doesn't mean emotions. You might have a repentance where you are really, and then you do cry. I get it. I get it. But it really starts with a decision of the heart. Okay? It may start here, but I've got to, I've got to change this. You know, one of the, one of the, um, the best scriptures is that the real time? Yeah. One of the best scriptures that God gave me when I first got born again was that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So if you confess and he cleanses you from all unrighteousness, what kind of unrighteousness is left? Nothing. But you notice it was just the word of that decision. 
So when I blew it as a Christian, when I fell into some sin or got tripped up, I would go right to 1 John 1, 8, 9. And I'd read it. And then I would just say it. I would say, the, I would say the prayer. And then I would just move on. And if I tried to bring it up, because the devil's there to remind you, God would say, what are you talking about? We already dealt with this. Let's move on. See, that's the integrity of God's word. That's the love that covers a multitude of sins. Okay? So if you get tripped up, if you do sin, whatever is happening, just confess it. Right? He'll cleanse you of it. Right? Doesn't kick you out of the family. Did you ever kick your baby out when they pooped their pants? No. You clean them up. Right? And you dress them in something nice. Again, a little baby powder so they smell good. And then you went on. Well, God doesn't kick us out of the family. Is that good news? Yeah. You know, when I first got born again, I just got saved and, and this song welled up in my heart. Oh, I once was a sinner, then Jesus set me free. Praise God in the highest heavens, his son delivered me. And that just went, came up. And I, I've never written a song before. And uh, it just came up. I just started laughing. I thought, that's a silly love song. And, uh, and the Lord loved it, though. It's not a silly love song, Greg. I put that in your heart to sing to me. Oh, right. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Hey, take a, I tell you what. Because of time, I want to read to you from the Passion Translation. Thanks, Josh. Revelation chapter 2, it, it ends in verse 7 with these words. He who has an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Which makes me think, okay, so you can actually be listening to someone and not hear. Are you listening to what the Lord is saying? To him who overcomes or to conquer, I will, give him, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Jesus is that tree of life. Listen to these words from your bridegroom king. Matter of fact, why don't you just close your eyes? Here's a word from the Lord to you today. You know that the name Ephesus means darling one. Every part of you is so beautiful, my darling. Perfect is your beauty without flaw within. Now you are ready, my bride, to come with me as we climb the highest peaks together. Come with me through the archway of trust. You can trust God. You can trust him at this archway, at this door that's opening up to you today. We will look down from the crest of the glistening mounts and from the summit of our sublime sanctuary. Together we will wage war in the lion's den and the leopard's lair as they watch nightly for their prey. For you reach into my heart with one flash of your eyes, I'm undone by your love. When you look at him right now from the eyes of your heart, he's undone. My beloved, my equal, my bride, you leave me breathless. I'm overcome. This is the bridegroom king. This is Jesus. By merely a glance from your worshiping eyes, for you've stolen my heart. I'm held hostage by your love, by the graces of your righteousness shining upon you. How satisfying to me, my equal, my bride. Your love is my finest wine, intoxicating and thrilling. And your sweet perfume praises 
Oh, your praise is to me so exotic, so pleasing. Your loving words are like the honeycomb to me. Your words of love to me. When you say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Watch your love for him grow when you say that. If you don't feel you love him enough, just say over and over, I love you, Jesus. And watch it grow in your heart. Your tongue releases milk and honey. For I find the promised land flowing within you. The fragrance of your worshiping love surrounds you with scented robes of white. My darling, my bride, my private paradise fastened to my heart. There's a tree on the inside of you and there's a private paradise where you and Christ commune and fellowship a place of intimacy, a place where you can say, into me, see, God. Lord, see into me. I want that place of intimacy, Lord. Lord, it's, I'm sorry, but it's kind of, I've gotten busy and, and um, not with bad things, good things. I've kind of neglected the word and I've neglected my time with you. Lord, please forgive me. Is that you today? Do you need to say that to him? Just say it to him, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for neglecting my time with you. And you know what? He says, I forgive you. <laughs> I'm dressing you in white. You're my darling, my bride. I love you. I've always loved you. There was never, not a time that I didn't love you. Oh, my bride. Come away with me. Come away. Let us run together. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here today and you've never invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, you've not been born again, or maybe you don't know what that means. The Bible very simply says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you just, where you're sitting, say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. Yeah, and now I give my life to you. I give my life to you, Jesus. If that's you, then you're born again. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus for reminding us, Lord, of how much you love us today. And Lord, thank you for forgiving us when we got too busy. We neglected our time with you. Oh, God, we see from your word how much you missed it. You missed it. Prayer's not a duty. Prayer's not a duty. Prayer's a relationship. Simply put, it's communication with you and your bridegroom king. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Could I have the ministry team come on up here? Thank you, Jesus. If you, from your heart, said, Lord, I missed it. I'm sorry. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Don't let the enemy bring guilt or shame on your life. Don't traffic in that. But if you're here today and you would like somebody to pray with you in regard to that, or if you have a physical need, emotional need, a spiritual need, and you would like prayer, because you know that wherever two or more agree together, he's right there in your midst. If one can put a 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000. Let this multiplication factor of the kingdom bring you to a, an amazing place. Yeah. Yeah. So God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Okay. And spend some quality time with him this week. All right? And if you need prayer, please come. Come.